Well, good morning and welcome. We're so glad that you've come. Um, one instruction that I'd love to give the family is sometime when we're standing in the hymn, turn around, see how many people are here. Paul touched so many lives. And so it's right to be able to come and celebrate his life, but also his faith in Jesus Christ. And that's the reason why we want to come and celebrate here. Let me begin with the words of Jesus from John 11. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the time to be able to come and celebrate Paul's life. He touched so many of us and in so many different ways. But the thing that we knew was how much he loved you, how much he depended and trusted in you. And so we come to celebrate the life that he had in you, the way that you enriched his soul. We pray therefore that you would come and be the guest of honor, that you would come, be with us and be pleased by all that transpires in this hour. For it's in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. If you're able, I would invite you to stand to sing hymn number 246, Man of Sorrows, What a Name. Please be seated. <coughs> we have a series of memories that are being put out. Kathy especially wanted to invite people who worked alongside of Paul, who were able to share time with him. Because you know, sometimes guys don't do a whole lot of talking unless they're doing a job together. Paul was a little bit like that, and so we thought it'd be great to have those. We'll do it without the introduction. Since everyone should have a bulletin, you'll be able to see the names of the individuals, and they'll be able to explain their involvement. First, I want to say to Kathy, you and Paul are a great team. Together, you welcome countless numbers of people to your home, of which I was a beneficiary. Your encouragement, fellowship, and love has been a great refreshment to me. I praise God for your service in the kingdom. Kathy asked that um, Romans 12, 3 through 8 be read because she said this really modeled Paul. So I'll read this. To, uh, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body, 
we have many members. And the members do not all have the same function. So we, though, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortations, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. The Apostle Paul warns us of thinking too highly of ourselves, a warning that is necessary because we are prone to do this. How do we look at our place in life with, as he says, sober judgment? Ironically, the narcissist may boast that he is God's gift to mankind, but the man of sober judgment actually is God's gift to, the, to his body, the church. The narcissist sees his self-worth built upon his own accomplishments or superior intellect, but the man of sober judgment realizes that any worthiness that he possesses comes by, as the verse opens, the grace given to him. Paul Pisani understood that well. His approval before God was that Jesus died and was raised for poor, helpless sinners. Sober judgment then considers in verse four, this one body, the church is made up of many members. Each and everyone has entered through the same door, the grace of God. If membership is not through personal credentials, then we realize that each member has significance and honor equal to ours. And I think that's what Paul really understood. Although we possess a common standing in the community of God, each person has been given a different gift or talent for the use in the community. When we exercise that talent, it is for the good of the community and not for self-aggrandizement. Paul Pisani faithfully exercised his gifts of teaching at Fellowship Bible Study, or FBS, as we call it. For those not familiar with FBS, it is a ministry of our church where each week we gather, sing hymns, study the Bible, and share a meal together. Our guests are people who might not have a place to call home or maybe on the fringes of polite society. That didn't matter to Paul, because he understood their value, and we understand their value because they're creating God's image. Paul became fast friends with Kevin and Sunlight Little, who have faith, faithfully served in leadership of this ministry for well over 20 years. Paul Pisani faithfully taught the scriptures. He didn't dumb down the scriptures nor did he just teach some kind of pious platitudes, nor did he make his lessons a seminary class. Rather, he engaged our guests in discussion around the text. He was not flashy. Come on, Paul isn't a flashy kind of guy. He called attention to the text and not to himself. He was open to feedback because he wanted to make sure that the passage was understood. Even as a quiet man, gentleman, he was welcoming to all our guests as we shared together over, over a meal. My late wife, Jessie, summed up the ministry of FBS's hospitality. We are welcoming strangers to our church and in introducing them to ourselves and even more importantly, to our savior. Paul Pisani's sober judgment of himself was key to exercising hospitality. He humbly, he humbly exercised his gift of teaching without condescension and welcomed strangers with love because he understood their value in God's sight. Elder Scott Sweeney conveyed to me that when the session went to visit Paul a month before his passing, that his final prayer request in his dying days was that he would know Christ better. 
This prayer request reflected another thing from the Apostle Paul is in Philippians 3, 8 through 13, and I will read that. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the, of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ Jesus, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. That was his prayer request. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Now that I have, not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not con consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting that which is behind, straining forward that which is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul Pisani's last prayer request was a sober judgment and humble testimony that even after all his years of living in his last month of life, he needed to continue pressing onto the prize for which God called him heavenward. His example to us is that of humility, using the gifts for the body and pressing on. And in that, he was indeed a gift from God to our fellowship. Paul Passanti got it. Paul understood that God's heartbeat from Genesis to Revelation is that God wants his people to tell all nations, all tribes, all people groups about Jesus so that they will come to worship him. Because Paul understood this, he was heavily involved in the ministry of GROW. A quick explanation of GROW is GROW is a ministry that teaches English to immigrants from over 50 countries that are living in Northeast Philadelphia. GROW's motto is helping immigrants thrive. This is accomplished by offering six levels of classes, five days a week, where volunteers befriend immigrants, teach them English, share the gospel, and Jesus as part of each and every lesson. My name is Keith Humphreys. I'm the executive director of GROW. And this is my friend, Randy Ardubian. Randy is on the board, he's our treasurer, and he's a teacher. Uh, Paul faithfully served on the board of GROW for the last five plus years. Along with directing the ministry as a board member, Paul was also very active in the ministry. Three years ago, when we decided that we needed a database to manage our 100 plus volunteers and our hundreds of students, Paul single-handedly managed, he, he, he did the research, he managed and set up the database that he arranged to get for us. For more than four years, Paul has humbly served as a teacher, a teacher's assistant, or a substitute in one or two classes a week for all 30 weeks of each class, of each other classes each year at our Mayfair site. Sue, the program director there said, he was a huge blessing to work with, a man whose heart to serve translated into both availability and dependability. Two and a half years ago, we were considering no longer offering Saturday morning classes because we couldn't afford to pay a program director uh, to come into the office. Paul offered to become the Saturday morning program director as a volunteer, which he did faithfully till just six weeks ago today. Paul loved immigrants. Paul's godly presence was evident in many areas of GROW's ministry. GROW is going to greatly miss Paul Passante. I verify with Kathy this morning a final thought. She said, it's okay to say 
that it's fair to say that Paul would have wanted to be sure that it was mentioned at his memorial service that Grow could use additional volunteers and ministry <laughs> partners. We need to love more of the 10,000 plus immigrants who they want to learn English, but they need to learn about Jesus. So you're invited. I think most of us were taken aback by Paul's diagnosis, how fast. Um, and so knowing that I wouldn't have an opportunity to visit him personally, I'm sure most of us desired to do that. Um, I, Kathy invited us to write letters. And this is a letter that I wrote. Um, and I like to think that it represents uh, uh, the, our GROW family, uh, what we would say to Paul. Uh, so this is what I wrote. Dear Paul, I just have to tell you how much we will miss you on the GROW board and how much I have appreciated you in the past several years. On the GROW board, you displayed great patience and wisdom. There was a point in time when we were looking at adding a second site, and uh, so the board was kicking that around, and so we were looking for support for that, and Paul was that voice. Paul stepped up and said, I think we should look at this again. I'll never forget that. From the board meetings, I remember you only asked questions when you were trying to clarify your understanding. You never forced your opinion on the board, but you were always supportive. In short, you offered great grace to our board. Thanks for showing us, Jesus. I appreciated your willingness to step in, first to lead a class at Fox Chase and probably Mayfair as well. And then also, as Keith mentioned, to lead, uh, be in charge of Saturdays at Mayfair. Your servant heart is such an encouragement to all of us at GROW. We realize God may be calling you away from GROW. Know that we are praying for you constantly. Know that Jesus is with you. He is your song and your strength. Thanks for being the hands and feet of Jesus to many at ESL. And I just read this this morning. I hope it applies. It's the verse of the day. John 5:24 NIV. It says, very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. So I'm Mike, uh, Paul's baby brother of by nine years, and I'm here speaking for myself and my brother Philip, who's Paul's little brother by seven years. Uh, our members of Paul are mostly from his days living in Alabama, uh, which spanned roughly from 1957 through the late 1960s. Um, those were Paul's high school years, his college years, and his very early professional career year, uh, years. Um, in high school, Paul was a living legend, and he was the subject of never-ending folklore. Uh, on many occasions, we were not Mike and Philip; we were Paul's brother. Uh, that's how they knew us. They, I don't think they knew our names, so uh, they knew Paul. Uh, no matter where we went uh, to class or conferences or camp or school events, social events, people would ask, are you related to Paul Pisani? When we answered yes, he's my brother, they would smile and most always launch into what became known as Paul stories. <laughs> These stories had several common threads, size, physical size, strength, character, and there was always a pinch of humor because everybody else was always smiling when they told Paul stories. Whether it was running through the woods or the forest with 200 pounds of weights on his back, which he did, uh, growling like a grizzly bear, scaring people, uh, 
lifting the front end of a Volkswagen on a wager from a friend. I bet you can't lift that car. He would do it. Uh, making something fit that wouldn't fit. He was good at that. <laughs> People had to tell the story because Paul had a special place uh, in their hearts. They felt good and happy sharing their story. Believe me, there are dozens and dozens of Paul stories. He touched people uh, wherever he went. One story that sticks with me is uh, Paul, in his high school years, uh, at, during the summertime, he was a counselor in a, at a camp, a YMCA camp. And uh, he got to know the kitchen staff, of course, really well, because he liked to eat, because he was a big guy. Uh, but those people that worked in the kitchen, they loved Paul uh, because he would, without asking, would help them lift 50 pound boxes of, of beans and food and stuff. He would clean the floor, he would wipe the tables, all without asking. And they knew, all those people that worked in that kitchen knew that Paul was blind to color, ethnicity, cultural background, those, those parameters never entered his head. And they sensed that and they knew that. And so years later, my brother Philip, he taught at the same camp years later, as did I. When we would go back there, those ladies would always ask, how's Paul? It wasn't a shallow question because we'd say, ah, he's fine. Uh, but they would come back and they'd say, is he still strong like he was? Uh, they would ask, um, is he kind like he was? Is he still smart like he was? Uh, and is he still nice like he was? And of course, the answer was always yes. Uh, so they would never forget Paul, and they loved Paul. And that's what Paul did wherever he went uh, in those years. Paul's passions in high school were athletics, mathematics, and music. That's a weird combination by today's standards, but that's Paul. Uh, when we first moved to Huntsville, Alabama in 1957, Paul had not played organized sports, but played the clarinet in the Butler High School Band. When we moved about 25 miles away to Decatur, Alabama the next year, the high school football coach sees this new guy walking down the hall. He makes a beeline for him. He says, uh, hey, you got you to gotta play sports for me. Uh, you're tall Paul. You got to do it. And Paul says, yeah, okay, I'll do it. So he starts playing sports for the Decatur High Red Raiders, and he lettered in football, basketball, track. He was a great swimmer also. So anything that along the line of sports, he always perfected and, and was the best at. But what he really dominated was football uh, because of his strength, his size, his agility, and his knowledge of the game. There simply was no better in that space and in that time. That was Paul. Uh, Paul, when he took up a passion, and you know, you people know this, because uh, I think it stayed with him all his life. When he took something up, he was all in 24-7 in, to master that passion. Uh, one of my favorite memories is when Paul organized a neighborhood football team. Uh, he reached out to Philip and I and said, I need your friends. We need to recruit your friends to come be on a neighborhood team. But unlike other neighborhood teams where, you know, it was all about who's going to be the quarterback and who's going to catch the ball, and, you know, you draw the play in the dirt and you do it for 15 minutes, uh, Paul was about teaching the fundamentals of the sport, uh, the blocking, the proper stance, the tackling, uh, and the reading the play, how to read the play. So he even went to the uh, high school uh, varsity equipment room and he borrowed helmets, pads, blocking dummies and tackling dummies for, you know, all us little guys. Now it wasn't normal to lend the equipment out like that, but his coaches at that time knew if Paul Pisani was involved in it, it was a good thing. And so they let him have that equipment and sure enough. Uh, but what, looking back on those days, one thing that I recognize was that through teaching, Paul teaching us little kids how to play the sport, 
Paul was further mastering his passion of playing and excelling at that sport. Because he was still playing, he was in high school, going about to go to college. Uh, so his teaching uh, was helping us and it was making him a better person. And I, by the way, I'll share that all Coach Paul's students at that time, they all played high school ball, uh, a few played college ball, and even one of them dabbled in the uh, pros. So uh, there's a Paul story for you. Uh, Paul continued his passion for music through his high school days. Uh, he was in a rock band. I don't know if you guys can appreciate that for a while. He played the saxophone, and if the song didn't call for the saxophone, he played percussion, either the bongos or a, a tambourine type of thing. Uh, they used to practice in his bedroom. Of course, that door was always shut, uh, but we could hear them, and uh, they didn't sound too bad. Uh, I'll never forget when his group got a gig, and they decided they needed a bandstand. They wanted to be up you know, on the stage. And of course, they didn't have a stage, and so Paul, he steps up to build a bandstand in our backyard. So he constructs it out of two by sixes and four by fours and sheets of plywood. It was a massive thing. Uh, of course, he gets it all built. And the next question was how to get it on the truck to move it to the field where they're playing. Not a problem. There's Paul. Uh, he and one friend lifted that stage, put it on a truck, and uh, they took it about, it was like 15 miles away. They set it up and uh, they had their bandstand. Uh, interesting thing is, my parents took me, I was about eight years old, uh, out to watch Paul play in that, in that uh, music gig. And uh, we went there, it was getting kind of dusky, and I'm, he's playing, and all of a sudden the song breaks out, and Paul, he gets on his saxophone, and he starts doing his groove thing, and he's moving. And there was, <laughs> there was these 15 young ladies. I gotta remember this back in the Beatles days and before. They were 15 young ladies on the front row pulling their hair out, screaming, Paul, Paul, Paul. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and the more they screamed, the more he got down on that saxophone. Uh, and then I was just, of course, again, I was eight. And I said, so I turned to my dad and mom and said, Why are they screaming for Paul? <laughs> they laughed. There's another Paul story for you. Uh, but anyway, Paul, he had unequal dominance in football, with that unequal dominance in football and his, and his academic excellence in math and science. Those combination of things resulted in him being recruited by nearly every major college program in the nation. Paul Bryant was in our living room begging Paul to sign on for a scholarship, as was Suge Jordan of Auburn. Uh, a group from uh, Notre Dame came down, it was a whole group of those, like three or four of them. People came from USC, Georgia, Tennessee, all wanting Paul to sign up for their college uh, football program. Paul chose the University of Kentucky. I think in hindsight he was influenced by a close friend going there uh, from his class and his like for Coach Collier, who was the coach at that time. Uh, who was a winning coach, but he was also known for his deep character and his fairness to players. Uh, he was easy to like. Uh, he had top-notch assistants that worked for him at Kentucky, including Don Shula, Chuck Knotts, Howard Schellenberger, Bill Arnsberger. If you follow football, you know those names. Those, those, those are famous coaches. Uh, they weren't famous at the time they were Kentucky because they were assistants, but they later went on to the pros to be winning coaches. So Paul had a great fall at Kentucky, and our dad enjoyed going to the games, watching Paul progress uh, in football. But unfortunately, at the end of Paul's freshman football season, Kentucky fired that coach that Paul had signed on with, and they hired a, a, a person named Charlie Bradshaw to take over the program. And this, this uh, back in this day, who Bradshaw was not the best of people, I don't think. He ran a torturous conditioning program designed to break players down. They wanted to uh, basically create machines, if you will, take away the personality, take away the heart, take away the drive to play ball because you want to play ball, uh, but to break it down into something mechanical. 
there was extreme physical and psychological abuse on the program. And this is all chronicled in, uh, in a book that came out some 20 years later. Paul, uh, but that year, that for his sophomore year, he started defense, uh, which was pretty unheard of back in those days. It's hard to relate nowadays because they have freshmen that are playing and so forth. But back in that day, uh, sophomores on the line did not play. It was usually your juniors and seniors that played uh, on the line. And he made some great plays. I know Philip and I were in the Kentucky Lexington Stadium, a beautiful stadium, 75,000 people. Uh, and you hear on the loudspeaker, the loudspeakers weren't that good, but you could make it out. Paul Pisani makes the sack. And I was, I was proud, baby brother. I always asked my dad, is that Paul? He said, yeah, that's Paul. And uh, it was a good thing. Uh, that sophomore year, Paul came home and he had a bandage on his hand. Our dad asked what, what was up, and Paul said, nothing really. I was cleated. Now, wasn't that Paul? Just nothing. If it hurt him or it was painful for him, it was nothing. Uh, and that's what he did. But when he took off the bandage, there was a puncture wound on the back of his hand where the cleat had gone through his hand. Uh, my dad said, have, have you seen a doctor? He said, no. The trainer said it would be fine. Just keep it washed out. It's nothing. Don't pay attention to it. That's what the trainer said. The next day, Paul's arm and leg were swollen three times their normal size due to the spreading infection. He had a rash all over his body. Uh, of course, we were in a small town. We took him to the main hospital, but all the doctors were off for the holiday. They couldn't see him. Uh, Philip, my brother, called his friend Nicky Evans, whose dad was a doctor, and uh, thankfully, Paul was immediately admitted to, to Bank Street Hospital, a little small hospital on a little uh, the back side of town, uh, and he was treated and then stayed in the hospital for a few days and turned out okay, obviously, but uh, uh, we were later told by the doctors if he had not had treatment, he would likely have died within 48 hours. That's how advanced the infection was. Uh, but that gave us our first personal glimpse into how brutal the program was that he was playing for. It was not the program he signed up for. The one he signed up for had character. It had ethical standards. It had heart. It had fairness. And then what he had, the, the second year in, the whole thing reversed, 180 degrees. And so luckily, uh, Paul had the strength and the courage uh, to leave that program. But there was 80-something people on that team that year. 57 of them left. Of course, Paul was the last of those 57 to leave. Uh, he stuck it out as long as he could. Out of football, Paul changed. He rolled in Birmingham Southern because of their math program, but he embraced their philosophy and religion programs to fill the void left by football. And you can imagine it was a huge void. Football was 70% of his life at that time. So now he turned to philosophy and religion. And as usual, he's all in. He starts reading and studying. And, and uh, he wanted to know all there was to know about it. Uh, he became a very, what I call a deep thinker, uh, often just, just deep, you know, what's Paul doing? I don't know. He's, he's thinking. And uh, he did that a lot. Uh, he wanted to know what the world's, what made the world's population tick. Uh, coming out of college, Birmingham Southern, he was at the top of a new game called computers. Computers were new then. And here was Paul. He was, he was at the forefront of the computer age. Uh, he went to work for Boeing, supporting the space program. And uh, just like he did with me and Philip when we were kids to, to teach us the fundamentals of something in order to learn even some things himself, he invited me to a day at his work and to teach me about supercomputers. And uh, I went, and I think in hindsight, not only was he teaching me, because he was all about teaching other people, but he was, again, making his passion or he's driving his passion to be the best that there was uh, what he was trying to do. 
In a book uh, by Shannon Ragland about the Kentucky football team, he describes uh, Paul this way. Paul was a mountain of a man. To me, mountain describes size, faith, stability, character, and depth. And that encompasses Paul. We will miss him, and I just wish more people would be like him. Uh, to me, in my eyes, Paul was a saint. I find a little bit of comfort in Psalm 116, 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. My name is Chris O'Brien, and uh, I had the privilege of being Paul's pastor about 10 years ago. Kathy was the church secretary. She thought she knew crazy until she met me, and uh, we served there at Third Church in Northeast Philadelphia together. Uh, Paul and I and the rest of the elders there and Kathy, the secretary, the women's ministry and um, having just heard his brother, uh, there's not a whole lot I can say to add to that. The writer of Proverbs says there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother and I think that sums Paul up. He was this big, massive man, physically, but as we would describe maybe other men like him, he was a he was a gentle giant. He was he was though, as his brother just described him, he could probably be he was ferocious on the football field. He was gentle dealing with people, and gentle bringing them the gospel. I don't remember all the details when I first met Paul and Kathy, but I do remember <clears throat> that not too long after that, our ministerial intern was a little nervous around Paul. And, uh, and I was trying to figure out what's going on. He, you know, it, it, Paul sort of reminded him somebody that, that scared him. And, and I said, well, what's the problem? He said, well, he's from Jersey, isn't he? I said, yeah, it's just across the river. Well, he's thinking of some mob boss or something. I don't know what's going on. This guy's supposed to be working with me in ministry and he's afraid of mob boss bosses. I don't know. Well, then I find out he's been binge watching The Sopranos. So, well, of course, Paul looks like one of those guys. But I was talking to one of the dear ladies who will go nameless and I won't look at her purposely so you know she's in that side of the room. <clears throat> but I, I made a mistake and I told her what I was going to say and she said, you can't say that, so I'm going to say it. <laughs> Paul was not a good man. He was a godly man. You know, there are funerals like memorial services like this that if you're not really pay attention you might just think they're like these other services where everybody gets up and says how wonderful this fella is or this gal is and all their incredible gifts and all and I don't mean to steal the thunder of the preacher but sorry I'm a preacher I can't help it <clears throat> Paul was a rotten sinner I said this one time at my church in Jackson, Tennessee. We were burying 99-year-old Miss Mamie. She worked till she was 94. And uh, then the Lord took her home even quicker than Paul. Through a blood clot, uh, having hip surgery, went straight to heaven. And, and that little church about, you know, the size of this part of the room was completely full. And there were all kind of people there from the, the town, Jackson, Tennessee, is a town of 80,000. And so I just got up and I said, I got to tell you something. Miss Mamie, she was a rotten sinner. 
And my elders on the front row that were the pallbearers, their mouths just dropped open. <laughs> but you see, and this is what I said, but now I got your attention. Because while we are rejoicing in his gifts and his abilities and the way the Lord took him through this very incredibly difficult time at the University of Kentucky and, and, and yet uh, while that hurt so many men, from what I understand, they became bitter and it stayed that way. Why did Paul not become that way? Because Paul was just somebody special? No, the grace of God intervened transformed his life. He came to understand the, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He came to understand that Jesus, the eternal son of God who took upon himself human flesh, we celebrated his coming a few weeks ago. And in a, and in a few months, we'll celebrate his death on the cross. He paid for sin. Paul trusted in him and lived for him. He didn't merely hang around with these people from these different people groups just because, you know, Paul wanted to do that. He loved people because Jesus had loved him and died on the cross for him. And so Jesus changed his life. And then Paul was able to change other people's lives. I didn't really want to have to go after Chris, but <laughs> tough to follow up. Um, I'm so grateful to uh, be here this morning. Um, I'm even more grateful that uh, I get to hear all these wonderful uh, Paul stories um, because those are, to you, those are Paul stories, but those are my, my pop-pop stories. Um, you all have known him as a friend, as a follower of Jesus, as a brother and a husband and many other things, but uh, I only knew him as my pop pop. Uh, growing up, he, <laughs> growing up, he was the man that I would come over to see with my grandmother and he would give me the strongest most unbridled hug that would crack my spine every time. <laughs> and I say nearly unbridled because as I was probably about as tall as his waist, there was a little bit of, of care and, and caution put into to the embrace. And as I got to maybe 12 or 13, it was, there was no air in my lungs. It was the most crushing embrace. And then as I grew to being an adult, I was finally doing a labor-intensive job that I could, I was strong enough to handle this powerful hug from my grandfather. Um, and I, th I think as I, th as I think of that, that is the example that I would want to share is how he had an unbridled love for me and my siblings um, and for many of the people I see here this morning. Uh, he was... Uh, kind and warm to me and there was never any reservations. I never felt as though I said anything he didn't approve of or, or felt uncomfortable about, uh, uncomfortable about. When I asked him uh, if I could help, if I could learn how to drive using his car, he said sure. And I drove with him once and then I used his car to uh, take my driver's test. And today, sitting outside of uh, his property, you can still see uh, the driver's permit tag on the driver's license. Um, he would call me up uh, on occasion and ask to get lunch, and we would meet and talk, and it was very simple. It was very honest. It was very unbridled. We would end and he would squeeze me very tightly. <laughs> and all the food we had just ate would begin to come up. 
we would talk about the shows we enjoyed. We would talk about um, work. There was a time that my siblings and I went to his bring your kid to work day. And I don't think any of us know what he did at that job. <laughs> we walked into his office. It had no windows. Uh, it was barely big enough for him, uh, let alone him plus four children. And we sat down, and he said, this is where I work. And we said, what do you do? And he said, well, I work on this computer. I think it was radar or sonar or something, but that was that day. And then we, <laughs> and then we went home. Uh, and we couldn't stop talking about how we have nothing to talk about. We had no idea what he did. Um, but we knew that he worked hard. We knew that he, uh, he worked hard and he provided for us uh, the most wonderful Christmas mornings. <laughs> Our grandmother would lavish us in gifts and he would make sure that my grandmother could lavish us in gifts. And he, would, he provided the car, he provided um, friendship, and I'm very grateful for whoever picked out that photo of him on the, on the brochures today, uh, because that pose and that demeanor is how I think I've seen him my entire life, uh, relaxed and, and uh, just happy to be around us. Towards, uh, towards the end of um, his life, uh, I sat down and spoke with him and I thanked him for two things. I thanked him for being a provider and showing me a good example of what a man should be. And the other thing I thanked him for was how warm he was uh, to my girlfriend, then fiance, then wife. Uh, he was so kind and his warmth towards her was so unbridled. He had no reason to uh, not love on her every time he saw her. And uh, that was, meant a lot to me. And I think that uh, as, I, as I listened to everyone's stories and uh, how they related to him, I'm just so grateful that there's so much more uh, Paul to be learned about and loved and heard. Uh, I'm a musician. I had no idea that he was a rock star. <laughs> when we meet in glory, that'll be one of the first things I ask him about. Um, I also didn't know that he served as uh, a teacher for the English second language classes for a long time until my wife and I started volunteering on our own. And when we brought it up, he said, oh yes, I've, I've been doing that as well. Here's some useful tips. Here's some things that have been helpful for me and, and what I've been using. And uh, one of the things that he liked to teach them was Psalm 1. Uh, I'd like to read that for you now. <clears throat> Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers, the wicked are not so, but they are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And as I look at this psalm, I see many things that my pop-up reflected, especially the part about the tree and how he was like a giant tree. And he, though his absence still feels fresh, he was part of my home and I loved him very much and he loved me. Uh, 
that same night uh, that I had met with him and thanked him for those two things, uh, I went home and I uh, prayed that the Lord would take him home soon. And uh, that night he passed away into glory and that was a blessing that I'm grateful for. Uh, I'd like to also now read Psalm 4 uh, that I think reflects uh, the Lord's goodness in that. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. O men, how long shall my honor be turned into shame? How long will, your, how long will you love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord will set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears when I call him. Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, who will show us some good? Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. In peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. So if you take the hymnals, and uh, if you're able, please stand. Turn to hymn number 32, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Let's unite our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your presence and for your peace. For in the midst of these times, we rejoice with our brother that his faith is now sight. The thing he had longed for all of his life is now something that he possesses, to be with you face to face in your presence forever. So we would not wish it otherwise for him. We are grateful that you took him to yourself, but at the same time, we recognize just the grief, the absence that will be felt very keenly by Kathy and by the family. We pray for your blessing on each of us, that our memories of Paul, our Paul stories, might indeed be ones that we find something to especially remember, not just the man, but also to reflect upon his life and how he lived it, the difference that he made, the way that he loved others because of the love you gave to him. He abounded in that love. To be able to give others the hope, a living hope in Jesus Christ because you gave him that hope. And so, Lord, we come. We come to you for you're the only one who can affect hearts. You're the only one who can speak to us in the quiet of our own lives. And so we come and ask that you indeed will continue to work in us that grace that you gave to Paul, that we may have the assurity of salvation like Paul, that we might be able to celebrate each day like Paul, and that indeed we might have learned well from the man who came to know you and who called upon you as his heavenly father. So give us comfort now, for it's in the precious name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Isaac gave us such a beautiful reading of Psalm 1, so I will begin with Colossians 3.1. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Matthew 6, 31, 33. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink? What shall we wear? But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And now, most appropriately, God has given this family these words, which I have witnessed in your life. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you. And the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. I don't know if you noticed, but in the, uh, in the bulletin, uh, in the program, just on the inside page, is 
the section that James just read, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. It was Paul's favorite passage. And it's an interesting passage to choose because Peter wrote this to those people who were in difficult times. It was when there were Christians who were being battered and beaten by people who were not protected by society in any way, shape, or form, and yet whose trust in God remained firm the whole way through. Paul realized that though he wouldn't say this defined his life, it certainly was one that he found such encouragement. And let's just walk through the passage very easily. First of all, is that God is our hope. God is the one who gives a living hope. And if you start thinking about it, as Paul did, he had that sudden realization that he had this big hole in his heart after football. And what was going to get him out of the bed in the morning? What was going to drive him and keep him going? What was going to be the hope of his life? And as he spent time looking at the writings that others had, he suddenly realized that he couldn't actually come up with anything that was lasting, that was sustaining until he met God. And then things started to click. He started to realize that rather than trust in a thing or rather than trust in another human being, he could trust in the divine God who didn't change. And he was able to say, I will provide for you. I will provide salvation for you. You don't have to try to achieve it. I will give it to you as your own. I know this sounds crazy, but you know, sometimes guys want to do it on their own. They want to be able to accomplish it on their own. They have to do it, good or bad, on their own. And you see, that's what's so amazing about salvation is God gives us salvation and then says, this is yours now. This is yours. You own it. The reason that you own it is because you know me and I provided it. But this is yours. And there was a satisfaction in that for Paul that was amazing. Because suddenly he knew that A, it was his, B, it couldn't be taken away because God himself was guaranteeing it on his character. So the only person who could take it away was God himself. And yet in this passage, look at verse 5. It says it's God who did it and God himself who guarantees and protects it. And Paul said, that's mine. I can hold on to that. The second thing is God is our joy. God is our joy. Paul had this kind of sly smile, you know. It would kind of creep across his face as you were talking to it and uh, talking to it, talking to him. And sometimes it was really funny to see uh, when we spent time together, we often were talking about God and we were talking about the scriptures and he always wanted to hammer deeper into a passage. Do you know that he used to get up at 5 a.m. in order to have a quiet time alone with God? He would study his Bible for at least an hour before he went to work every day. He wanted to make sure he had that time protected. That time when he could build his love, not just build on hope, but build his love for the person who had provided him the hope, the person who loved him, the person who filled his life with joy. Joy in the midst of sometimes hard things. There's a passage in in Hebrews, which I'd just like to read. I'm going to do it in a, in a translation, a version which is unusual. It puts it kind of more in the vernacular. Remember those early days after you first saw the light? They were hard times. Kicked around in public, targets of every kind of abuse. Some days it was you, other days your friends. If some friends went to prison, you stuck by them. If some enemy broke in and seized your goods, you let them go with a smile, knowing they couldn't touch your real treasure. Nothing they did bothered you. Nothing set you back. So don't throw it all away now. You were sure of yourselves then. It's still a sure thing. See, that's what's interesting about this passage because in verses 8 and 9, it says, you might not see him, but you love him. You might not see him now, but you believe in him. See, that's what faith is. Faith is is not something that we kind of conjure up and say, oh, I hope, I hope, I hope, you know. I wish, I wish, that it might be true. 
No, this is solid fact because of who our God is. Because of how he has come to love us and how we know him. That's the faith that we have. But more than that, that's our joy. God is our joy. And last, God is our bond. It's hard to find a word in our society. In old days, it was called a surety. If you're in the financial field, you know exactly what that is. But God is our trust. God's the one we can trust in because he's trustworthy. God's the one who promised something, and that's what this passage says. God promised something, and he fulfilled it. He came through with it. And Paul knew that. Paul knew that so thoroughly. You know, it's, it's interesting to spend time with people as they are coming to the end of their earthly life. Some have a very difficult road. Some, it's on. But the ones who really know Christ, there's a real difference for them. Um, Paul was not a great singer, but he enjoyed good singing, which was good because Kathy would sing to him. And so uh, when he was, he was in hospice, Kathy and I went in. We started singing Christmas carols. He wouldn't have any of it. <laughs> Forget that. You know? But we had to sing his favorite hymn. Do you know what it is? Because we're about to sing it. So I hope you do get to know what it is. The interesting part was Paul just didn't have time for the other stuff. Thank you very much. He had time for God. He had time for the people he loved, but he really wanted to live all out. There was a, a Christian of yesteryear at the turn of the 20th century by the name of William Borden. He was the heir to the great Borden fortune, and he had a job that was waiting for him. His parents gave him a round the world trip for his high school graduation, and two months later when he came back, he said, I've seen a need in this world and it's a need for people to know God through Jesus Christ. I believe God's calling me to be a missionary. He went through college, and during that time, he realized that God was calling him to China. So he went to seminary for a few years, and then he took off. He was going to reach out to a tribe in China that were Muslims, and so he decided to stop in Egypt on the way out to be able to learn Arabic. And two months after getting to uh, Egypt, he died of spinal meningitis. When the word was flashed back to the United States that the heir to the great uh, Borden wealth had died, many people were upset. They said, what a waste. But when his family received his Bible, when it was sent back, they looked and he had written three two-word pithy statements in his Bible. The first was no reserves, either of wealth or energy. No retreat. He was going to head to China. He was going to head to what God had put before him to do. And the third he wrote in just a few days before he died, no regrets. Paul lived his life that way. He understood the hope that God had given him, that living hope. He understood the joy that God's presence would give him through every day of his life. And he knew that this gospel was trustworthy. God had promised it. God had delivered in it. And now God invited Paul to be able to share it. To him, that was the greatest thing in his life. It was the thing he wanted to do with every minute that he could. He definitely did not want to live with regret, and he didn't. So we're grateful for that. So now I'd invite you to turn to hymn 481, turn your eyes upon Jesus. There are three verses. The first talks about our living hope. The second talks about salvation that is ours. And the third, the third talks about the urge to share this with the world. So let's stand and sing well.
just before I give the benediction, I want to invite all of you to a reception that will be up in Fellowship Hall. You can go through either of the doors at the front and straight up. If anyone desires to use an elevator, go all the way through this door, and at a 45 degree angle, you'll find the elevator there. But please come. There are so many more Paul stories that need to be shared. Do please come up. And now receive God's benediction. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Thank you.